All right. So we've got exam week. Uh, lab practicals up. Went live about 8 a.m. today. Uh, you've got until the end of the day on Friday to do it. That's a due date, 11.30. Don't miss it. It is 60 total questions. <clears throat> so it was, instead of having multiple questions per, per slide, it, it's just 60 of them. Uh, it's out of 55 points, so there's five questions that are extra credit. So they are error site slides that I am sure you have not looked at. Let's see. So use the information, use what, what we've been learning uh, to answer those. Uh, most of the questions are multiple choices. Nearly all of them are. Uh, there are questions where I, I asked what is the genus or what is the species of this parasite? Those are fill in the blanks. Those are fill in the blanks. Uh, and all of the multiple choice, I believe, have six options. So it's not just simple four, I added six. Right. 75 minutes, that's a minute and 15 seconds per, which should be okay. It's just one, it's multiple choice, you should be able to get through those. As long as you feel comfortable uh, looking at the images, then, then we, we should do good. We should do good. All right. This week's in lab, uh, I'll have the nematode slides out so you can start looking at those. Uh, but if you wanted to look at, you know, review of the platy helminths, you can also do that. Uh, in lab, we will pick out the dates for the presentations for this batch of presentation. We're going to present over the next two weeks. So some of you be presenting next week, though those that are on there. Uh, so on Blackboard, I did have that. Um, move this over. So you've got your species presentations. I went ahead. There is this is going to be a folder for the nematodes and acanthocephalin presentations. Uh, I did just kind of put up who was presenting. So what you can do is is kind of plan ahead. Do you want to present next week, Monday, or the following Monday? Um, we need a, at least a couple. And if we have, so I didn't mark to see if these are all Mondays or Wednesdays. I think we have a, we have a split. So what we'd like to do is avoid having all the presentations on, on a single day. So check it out, look at it. Um, we'll pick our dates in lab this week. Had a question on how to view the exams. So I did. Uh, I went through and made all of the rest unavailable, so all of the old ones, because they, they were due on Sunday. And I said, you need to get them done. You had your, your, your ability to take them late up through Sunday night. So that way, I can close them out. And everyone now has access to, uh, to the keys. So if you go to your quizzes, let's see here. Grades. Do your my grades. You'll have your. Uh, you can see the, these are ones that I can take. I guess, uh, but you'll have the score. I don't think it's on this image. I think if you click on the quiz, it'll open up a new window or a new page. Which then, when you hover over the score, your icon will change. And once you click on that score, then the key should open up. All right. So if you're going through it and you had questions, hey, this one was, was marked wrong, but I think it was correct, please email me. Um, please email me, and I'll double check. And if that's the case, then I'll update, you know, fix the key, uh, and everything gets, gets regraded. Questions? We got Platy Hellman, these. When is the actual exam open? Wednesday morning. Early, early Wednesday morning. It, it'll go live. You'll have until the end of the day on Thursday, so Thursday night to get it done. Uh, it will be in two parts. Um, it will be in two parts. So uh, part two will be the life cycle questions, uh, and it'll be set up so you will have. I'll have to do it manually and probably fix fix the grade in the grade book, but. You know, based on however many questions, and I'll let you know on Wednesday, if there's 
40 questions, it'll, it'll, instead of being out of 40 points, it'll only be out of 30 points. Uh, and I'm not going to mark certain ones extra credit. What I'll just do is take whatever score you get, all right, and scale it out of, out of 30, or put it out of 30 points. So if you get like 40 points out of 30, it's not going to be 10 extra credit points. You'll just get a 30 out of 30 on that. Uh, the idea is, you know, in, in, in a regular exam, you would have your choice of what life cycle to, to present. And I know we have a lot of information, a lot of different life cycles. So by choosing which one you want to do, you're picking the one that you feel most confident about. Well, we can't really do that with Blackboard quizzes. So what, what we'll do with Blackboard is just scale it, lower the total number of points. And uh, you know, if you do better than the total points, you get 100% on, on that portion. Uh, if you do less, you know, let's say out of 40 questions, you only get a 20, 28 out of 40. Well, that's actually a 28 out of 30. So that, that's, that's how we're going to do that. All right. So look through your notes. You should be studying. If you have questions, please bring them to class or email me. All right? Or email me. Yep. Can you explain the difference between Bothria and Bothria? Bothria and Bothridia. Yeah, we can do that. The difference is in the scholars. So Bothria are sucking grooves. Uh, let me close that out. Do this. So they are only weakly, weakly muscular. So a classic one is like Diphilobothrium, where it is just kind of almost like a flap. That's the that's the bothria. Bothridia will have so like none of these really have a plates. This one could be close. Um, how, however, they they diagrammed it, but they've got these leaf like structures. These leaf each of these structures is a bothridium. So if they have a you know several bothridium, then it'll be a both bothridia scolex. Uh, a lot of them end up having four on them, but I can't say they always have four. Uh, because several of them only have two bacteria, but they have these leaf-like structures, and then those structures could be highly could be modified in, in many different ways. So a bacteria has the bacteridium, these leaf-like structures. Bacteria only has a groove. The grooves like this one. It's got some hooks, but it's kind of almost cup-shaped. Uh, this one here. So that would be your your bacteria. Good on that. Yeah, and there, there's a lot more. Uh, if we did a search, I'm sure it'll pop up very similar to the ones. Look at that. Sure, pull that right off. This is a actually a good one. Uh, see if we can zoom in a little bit. This one's much better. You can actually see what looks to be flaps. Um, and those are, like, between those flat flaps are is the groove that it could then kind of just clamp down. And it doesn't really clamp down completely. So I guess in this angle, it almost looks like you've got this leaf shape, but it's not. It, it, the leaf shapes kind of extend down, whereas this is continuous with, with a more of a neck region. Um, yeah, they, they just have, have a lot of different ones. All similar shaped. There's an SEM image of it. You can see the groove. And it's different from the Bothridia. Variations. But you can definitely clearly see the leaf-like structures. All right, a lot of variation. All right, we're on nematodes. So we left off with just getting to the digestive system. So we've, we've had been plenty of helmets, right? They either had no gut, no mouth, or they had a gut with a mouth. Um, 
for the nematodes, we actually have a complete digestive system. You have a mouth and an anus. Right. What's, the, what's the advantages of that? Like a tube inside of a tube. What's the advantages of that? You can eat more. Uh, yeah. I guess you could constantly have it. Yeah, so you're not regurgitating stuff repeatedly, but you have an anus, like maybe you have more of a digestive system, so more opportunities for nutrient absorption. Okay, so I think that's that's the kind of the right idea is that you have the ability then to have to partition what's happening in the gut. All right, you can have a period like our stomach. All right, acid, it's breaking food down, it's churning it over, and then you have a region that's primarily absorption. And then in our intestine, you actually have different regions of absorption and specialization on, on what is happening in terms of digestion. So that's like a big advantage. All right, you don't really see that when you have a blind gut. It's just a gut, it's absorbing, and that's it. But for here, we can kind of compartmentalize what's happening along the length of the GI tract. So we're going to break this down into three different parts of the gut. So we've got a foregut, a midgut, and a, a hindgut. So in the foregut, it'll consist of the mouth, the buccal capsule, and the pharynx, and the, or the esophagus, all right? So the mouth is called stomodeum. Right? That was the, the initial term for it, all right? And that stomodeum is just basically a mouth, all right? And then... In that mouth, we have this buccal capsule. So the mouth is the opening itself that leads into the buccal capsule. All right, and that capsule could be either simple or it could be complex. And with simple, you just mean it's almost kind of like an atrium-like structure. Or it could be complex, meaning it's highly modified into like an attachment or uh, an additional cutting. We'll see cutting plates with the hookworms and so forth. And then that buccal capsule leads into our pharynx or the esophagus. All right, now you're gonna see various diagrams kind of separate, you know, uh, or break down the variation in our esophagus types or the pharynx. But by and large, what this is, is it's a muscular structure. The entire thing is a muscular structure. That muscular structure is designed to suck food into the worm, all right, and to push food through the rest of the gut. So it's sucking food in and then the forces, its action is going to push food into and along the gut because the gut is just going to be flat. It's not going to be musculature or it's not gonna have peristaltic activity and so forth. Now what's important is that this entire foregut is cuticularized, meaning it has it's part of the cuticle. So what does that mean? What's the consequence of that for, for these worms? It's going to be harder to um, absorb the nutrients in that part. Uh, yeah, but we're not really absorbing nutrients in in that pharynx region. So they're going to molt that. They molt it, so in the cuticle gets molted. So this first part, this foregut, will get molted as the worm grows. Now, as pharynx and esophagus. Can take on different types and, and different and variations, just kind of depending on the worm. A lot of this probably came down to what they were feeding on. So bacterial wars, those worms that are feeding on bacteria tend to exhibit same type of esophagus, all right, same pattern of esophagus. So we've got some, like strongylida, that are very highly muscular along the entire length, right? Very, you know, the wider the width, more muscular. Compared to the asteroids that don't really feed on the bacteria, they can, but that's not their primary food source. It's only weakly muscular, right? They don't need to really suck a whole lot of food in. They don't need that, that, that force. Others, you've got a weakly muscular front end and then this large esophageal bulb. So you're not really sucking in a whole lot of food but this bulb is, is helping to force the food through the rest of the gut, all right? And then you even have some of these where the cells aren't, or the, 
entire esophagus isn't muscular. You actually have a glandular portion tied to it. All right, so again, you have all these different variations based on their feeding type and, and group of the worm and, and so forth. So, and, and actually, it's very numerous. We can't really go through and start talking about each of them. We're going to see some different esophagus types uh, in um, in our slides in lab, you'll primarily see this one and this one, that, those two shapes. All right. So, all right, the MIGDA. This is basically the middle part of the intestines, or the, the start of the intestines after the esophagus or pharynx. All right, this section is uncuticularized, so this part will not be shed will not be molted as our organism grows. Now, this is just simple layer of usually columnar cells. Right? So those of you that have had uh, anatomy or possibly histology you know, should be able to recognize and know, have a visual image, mental image of columnar cells. But it's typically just a single layer. All right? There's no muscles right? because you don't really need it. We're relying on the muscular action of the pharynx, or the esophagus, to push food through the gut. All right? And we need that because we have a lot of hydrostatic pressure happening inside of the actual body cavity. You've got that pseudocelums, fluid filled, the cuticles providing pressure that's keeping the intestines flat, which means we have to find a way to push that, that food right through it. Uh, we'll see this in cross section. We've got some cracks sections of worms to look at and you'll see you'll know what what part of the body we're looking at if it's intestine or esophagus based on the appearance of the intestine you'll see it as being flat Ready? All right, the hindgut. This is cuticularized, just like the foregut. So this part of the gut will be molted. And this is basically the very posterior end, the very last part of the gut. That's our hindgut. And it contains a subterminal proctodeum. The stomodeum was the gut. The subterminal proctodeum. Depend, it varies based on the sex of the worm. So this is the anus for female worms, because the females will have a separate opening, will have a, a vulva and vagina for the female system. But in the males, that opening, that anus is shared with the reproductive system, so it's called the cloaca in the males. So this is a subterminal proctodane. If you can tell just from the subterminal, we're not at the very tip or the very end of the worm. We're actually before it. We're before it. So it was, if it was terminal, it'd be at the tip. But we're subterminals. We're not. We're not at the end. This subterminal proctodeum so it includes the anus or the cloaca, depending on the sex. It also includes the rectal di dilator muscle. So you've got all of this pressure. You have the pharynx pushing everything down. You've got pretty strong muscles to keep food in so that absorption can happen, so that uh, uh, food kind of goes down slowly. Uh, it's these muscles that control when the worm's going to defecate. Now, these contents are under so much pressure that we can actually shoot or expel waste quite a distance. So imagine someone holding this ascrosum just to figure out that it can shoot its waist up to 60 centimeters. That is pretty impressive, right? I can imagine zoology students with live worms doing that, right? Lining it up, how far can the air shoot? All right. But that is the hydrostatic pressure. That's how, how strong it is. Good? Yep. All right, osmoregulatory excretory systems. Right. Now, the 
Osmo regulatory function is going to be correlated to their native environment. Right, it'll be much more developed for organisms living in freshwater environments. Right, does it, it's going to be less developed for those not living in those types of environments. Right? Uh, in some cases, the osmoregulatory system relies on diffusion uh, of water across the cuticle. Others, it needs this excretory system to primarily move the water. Now, fortunately, you know, a lot of these worms kind of get around the problem of water balance by being osmoconformers. So whatever the solute concentration is or the water concentration is out in the environment, the adult worms tend to be the same, so they don't have to deal with, with massive influx of water or massive loss of water. Some of our worms do possess this secretory or this excretory system, and in a lot of cases, it's tied to also their secretory cells. Now, this is fairly interesting type of system. So we've talked about like the flame cells, protonephridia. All right, and as we kind of, those are kind of like the precursors to the nephrons. Uh, not so with our nematodes. Our nematodes can possess specialized cells called rennet cells. These are ventral gland cells that ultimately open to the exterior via a mid-ventral pore. So I'm just going to move back up one slide. We've got these marked as the excretory pore. So that would be the pore that these rennet cells would ultimately open up to. This is unique to the nematoda. All right, you don't have these cells any put cells. So in our diagrams, these are all the variation. You would have these rennet cells there. That's what these you know, the nuclei are marked. Now the entire system varies based on the groups that, that we're looking at. All right, but in most cases, our nematodes have some variation on an H shape. So you'd have your rennet cells in the middle, and then you'd have longitudinal collecting ducts running the length of the worm. Typical shape. Right. These are going to be, these ducts are going to be lying in the lateral epidermal cords. Right. So when we get to ascaris and we see we've got cross sections of ascaris, we'll clearly see the dorsal and ventral nerve cords, the lateral cords, are going to contain the excretory canals. All right, so these canals lie in the lateral part of the worm, and then you're going to have this transverse connection closer to the anterior end, and that transverse connection is going to be where we find these rennet cells. And then they open up into an excretory pore. It, it's function, excretory, as well as secretory. So it could release compounds, could release, let's say, inhibitor molecules um, to try to invade the host immune system. Now, not all of them are H-shaped, or this H shape. Some of them just kind of have a, a single one, but they do have these rennet cells, and those rennet cells are unique to the nematode. good? All right, reproductive system. Typically, our worms are dioecious. Right, we're going to have male and female worms. You're gonna re you often rely on sexual reproduction. And typically in the nematodes, we're dealing with dimorphism, where our females tend to be larger than the males. And our males tend to have a curved tail. So it, it's, I'd say the curved tail tends to be somewhat reliable. The more you've looked at nematodes, the more you can kind of recognize and say, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that looks like it's curved, that's a male tail. But you have to recognize that when you preserve the worms, sometimes you preserve them in a contracted state, so just the entire body's curved. What we'll do is break down the male system first and then the female system. All right. So the male system usually has a single testis. And unlike our platyhelminths, our testis and our ovary are more tubular. I have this here as it's being solid and thread-like. If you had zoology and you remember the ascaris dissection, if 
you had it in the spring, last spring, you probably didn't do it, <laughs> dissection. But in previous years, you would have. Open up, ask for a swarm, oftentimes you see this entire spaghetti-like mass. That spaghetti-like mass are the gonads, or the reproductive system. So our testes is typically just a single tubular structure. So at the very tip of it, that's where you're, you're producing your sperm cells, and then as you progress, it transitions to the vas deferens, all right, where the sperm will mature and then hang out and wait. It leads to the ejaculatory duct, which then opens up into the cloaca. All right. Now, in our nematodes, we have accessory structures, but not all of these accessory structures are going to be present in, in uh, all of our species. All right, the one that tends to be present in all of them, I think it is present, in all of our species, is a spicule. So the spicule is a chitinized structure. It's a hard structure. Its function is to hold open the, the vulva so that the sperm could be transferred over to the female. So contrast that with the platyhelminths. We, our sperm transfer organ was the serous. The serous goes in, inserts in, and then the sperm, the flagellated sperm, get deposited into the female system. In this, in the nematodes, we don't have flagellated sperm. So what's going to happen is your spicule will go in, hold open the vagina, or hold open the, the vulva, and then these, these non-flagellated sperm will crawl along the spicule to get into the female system. And I included a diagram here so you can see. This is what one of these nematode sperm would, would look like. You don't have the flagella. It's not swimming. Instead, it's going to more glide with some ciliary action. Uh, and so you've got this pseudopod, uh, pseudopodia. It'll glide along that spicule. So spicule isn't delivering sperm. It's actually holding open the vulva. Because again, we're under a lot of intense hydrostatic pressures. So this thing's going to hold open the vulva so that sperm can be transferred. Our spicule can be sheathed, so it has kind of like a fleshy structure that, that the uh, spicule could be housed in. Um, it typically doesn't cover the entire length, but it could. Uh, and I'm trying to think, I think we have a slide of, the, uh, of a male worm that infects the sinuses of some of our mustelids here in the States and in Europe. Uh, and I believe those spicules are sheathed and you can actually see the, the sheath. I've seen pictures. I don't know if those are ones that we have on the slide. Another organ accessory structure is the gubernaculum. Right, this is also a sclerotized structure. Right, it's a hard structure. The gubernaculum is part is, is a portion of the rectum, and its function is to guide that spicule. Kind of guide it that spicule can pass into the uh, out of the cloaca. Kind of helps guide it out of the cloaca. Again, this is one that it's not in every every worm. And actually, in our prepared slides, we don't see it. We don't have it. So we would rely on finding adult worms in some of our, our pre living organisms and hope that some of those are species with the gubernaculum. Uh, we could look at it. Um, I know you'll see it. Spicules. The we can get a gubernaculum. So on our diagram, we don't have one listed. So apparently there is a gubernaculum that appears during human development. Oh no, come on. Can't find it. All right, so here's one. Uh, gubernaculum, the spicule would be this structure, and it can be pulled in, could be stuck out, and then the gubernaculum would look to be a much smaller structure located right near the cloaca, 
that acts as a guide. So as the spicule gets gets put out, this guides it out of that cloaca. Uh, we don't have one on our diagram here. This one just has a spicule. So, gubernaculum. We do have specimens with our last accessory structure, a copulatory bursa, or just called a bursa. Right, the bursa is this extension of the tail, modification of the tail, that functions in grasping and holding the female during mating. All right, this is partially what the curved tail could be used for. So if the tail is curved, kind of the female can, can come in and it can grasp on and hold on to the female so that the spicule could then come out and hold open uh, the vulva to get the sperm transfer. Other times, we don't have that curved tail, so instead it'll be more like an umbrella-like structure. And we'll see this in our hookworms. All right, so I didn't, I didn't make diagrams of those because I know we'll get to them, we'll look at them, uh, when we introduce the individual species. Female system, also similar in that our, our gonads are more thread-like, right? It's solid. So typically, our female system is didelphic, meaning it's paired. It's a paired type of system. And that's how I diagrammed uh, the order. So we have an ovary, solid ovary, and then it starts opening up into a hollow where it's the oviduct, so the eggs are starting to mature. Uh, and then you have your uterus, and then that leads to the ovijector, which leads, uh, all right, so that's one, and then you'll have your second, your paired system, which is basically the same system. Both of those ovijectors then merge to form the vagina, which then opens at the vulva. Their ovaries thread-like. This juncture between the ovary and the oviduct, so when we start transitioning, and we know our transition because we start getting hollow in the actual tube itself. That is where we're going to see fertilization. So it act, that area tends to hold sperm uh, from the male, so that when ova gets released into that space, you can then have fertilization occurring. The uterus is muscular, and it's typically m more muscular at the distal end so that it forms the ovigector. And then the vagina is going to be muscular. Again, hydrostatic pressure inside the worm is trying to push things out. It's going to be muscular to keep the eggs in until the mature and the, and the worm releases it. Our vulva typically opens up some place in the mid, mid portion of the worm. So it could be in the anterior third, it could be in the posterior third, but it's not at the very ends. All right. We're good. All right, nervous system. We're going to have a circumesophageal nerve ring. So like in the platyhelminths, we had our paired ganglia. This one, our ganglia actually forms a nerve ring. Uh, and we kind of have one to kind of demonstrate that nerve ring. And I'm going to go back a few slides to here. So this is marked with our nerve ring. All right, at the anterior end, it's circumesophageal. Right. And going back one more slide, what we often see with our nerve rings there is that we'll have a constriction in our esophagus, and where that constriction is tends to be where the nerve ring is. Now, we don't always see that because the esophagus types can vary, but when we do see restriction, a constriction, that is where our nerve ring is. Now, from this nerve ring, right, we're going to have dorsal and ventral nerve cords coming from it. So the nerve ring itself is variable number of ganglia, variable number of cells. And then you have your nerve cords that run the length, and along the nerve cord you have various ganglia as well. Coming from these nerve cords, we have uh, sensory nerves, nerves that go out to the papillae, 
are for mechanoreception, reception, uh, bristles, uh, and so forth. And between these nerve cords, we could have commissures that connect the two. Again, species specific. These are going to be the dominant ones, the ones that are most prominent in our, in our cross sections. Some of our worms also have these lateral nerve cords. They're going to be much less prominent, right? but they also have other nerves branching off from them. And they run the length of the worm. At the posterior end, we have the preanal ganglion which is the most posterior of the ganglion. And on our, this is our uh, ventral nerve cord, so the preanal ganglia. From here, this gives rise to all of the nerves that form this posterior nerve ring. So it's not necessarily like a subesophageal ring, but it forms a ring, and from that ring then you have the various uh, nerves, sensory nerves, so the sensory papillae in that caudal end. Diagrammatic. Any nerves that branch off are going to connect to some sensory structures. And innervate, and innervate muscles. So instead of having a ladder-like system, we now have nerve ring with uh, dorsal ventral nerve cords and lateral curve, lateral cords. Now I haven't really talked about the life cycle, all right? And that's going to be next. And before we get to the life cycle, I want to talk about the eggs because these worms are going to typically lay eggs. A lot of many of the ones that, that we see in the in the lab, they are. It's uh, they're going to lay eggs and then the eggs hatch. Not all of our nematodes do this though. Some of them are ovoviviparous, so our larval stages develop inside of an egg membrane in the uterus, and then the worm gives birth to live young. We'll see some of those, like our our filarial worms, the, the worms that cause like dog heartworm. The, those are ovoviviparous. Uh, but when the eggs get released, the eggs are actually pretty well developed. Or I should say the egg shell tends to be well developed. The shell itself consists of three main layers. There's going to be this outer vitellin layer. There's going to be a chitinous layer beneath that, and then a lipid layer underneath that. All right, so in our diagram, just kind of a brief Schematic, we've got a vitellin layer, a chitinous layer, and then a lipid layer underneath that. And then inside would have our, our actual embryo developing. Some of our eggs have this fourth layer, which is typically a proteinaceous layer. This layer is contributed by the, uter by the cells of the uterus. Hence, it's called the uterine layer. It's these layers, these four layers, which gives the egg not only its shape and its structure, but also its impermeability. So eggs that have all four layers, this uterine layer and the lipid layer itself, tend to be highly resistant to chemical disinfection. And why is that? Well, we have to think about what, what the structures are, all right? And specifically, like, what is the polarity of the compound? So if you have a lipid layer, the lipid could, could allow nonpolar compounds to get through, that lipid, other lipid-like compounds, but it blocks anything that's hydrophilic. And it's a kind of the basis, if we look at our cell, cell membranes, the bi, bi, bilipid membrane, phospholipid membranes, right? So they block one type, but then if you also have 
a proteinaceous layer, now you've done the other side. Now you're blocking those lipids, but you're going to let some of the more hydrophilic ones, compounds, get through. So the, the outer vitamin layer is primarily lipoproteins. All right, the chitinous layer is going to be basically made, made of chitin. It's also usually the thickest layer, and in some of our, our egg images that we'll see, that's what kind of gives it some of the structure, some of the patterns in the egg. Lipid layer, obviously, is made of lipid. All right. And then the proteinaceous layer, this layer that's contributed by the uterus, really consists of acid mucopolysaccharides. And that's kind of like that last bit, or the first line of defense that really makes these eggs highly resistant. So much so that, I'm sure you probably didn't know it, but some of those ascarids that you were dissecting, bad eggs, some of those eggs were probably infectious. If it was only chemical disinfection, probably infectious. They survived formaldehyde. They survived bleach. Remarkable. Now, eggs get laid, and then they're going to hatch. And we have a generalized life cycle. Now, now we're making this big jump from all those different life cycle stage names based on what classes we're in in the platyelminthes to something that is very, very simple. We've got our egg. When that hatches, it releases a J1 larvae or an L1 larvae. And then that's going to molt to a J2, that molts to a J3, that molts to a J4, and then that molts to our adult. Very simple. Right? You don't have to keep track of the myricidium, the cotylocidium, the oncomyricidium. It's just J1, J2, J3, J4, and then the adult. So probably the hardest part will be just keeping track of, is there a J5 or not, right? Just, <laughs> you'll, you'll say J4 and then say, man, is, it, is there a J5? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'll say some, some people will include a J5. Maybe that's somewhat optional based on the species. Or perhaps that is a misidentification where that is an adult. It's just it hasn't matured yet. So it just kind of was given the name of a J5 by accident. Now, these Js are just basically juvenile stages. That's what, what they get their, their name, why they're a J. And that's why also, if you look them up, sometimes they're called an L, a larval stage, L for larval stage. Now, what you, we remember is that in order to get to our next stage, our cuticle has to be molted. All right? So going from a J1 to a J2, our cuticle has to molt, and then the cells enlarge. And that's how, that's how we get bigger. It's not all of the cells. Some of our organs actually exhibit mitosis, uh, but many of our cells will enlarge. What stage is infective? Typically, it's going to be that J3 stage. So if you're unsure, if you answer J3, that's probably correct, unless... The infective stage is the egg, which then requires a J3 to be to be developed to a J3 inside of that egg. So we'll have some specificity as to list out how developed that egg has to be before we can get an infection. Now, even though it's a simple, simple generalized pattern, the life cycle diversity that we see is massive. All right, there's variation just across the board, even within, uh, in classes, you're going to see variation in the hosts and the patterns. So some of our life cycles are going to be direct, one host life cycles, where you've got this free living stage, and then the free living stage gets into the next host. Some of them are indirect, where we need two hosts, or maybe even three hosts, most commonly two hosts, in the complete life cycle. Some of our life cycles, our, our parasitism is required. You know, you have to be inside the host in order to reproduce. In other life cycle stages, you can have, it's more facultative. So you get into the adult, into the, let's say, the vertebrate host for the, for the parasitism aspect, and you get sexual reproduction that occurs. But if the adult, if that female doesn't get into that host, they might be able to, she might be able to reproduce through parthenogenesis that she continues her, her genetic line. Some of our life cycles, 
uh, aren't necessarily hosts per se, but they rely on insect vectors for transmission. So the vector is what delivers the parasite to our next host. Some of our life cycle stages, reproduction is through diocese. So, you know, your gametes, your male and female gametes. Some of them are parthenogenesis, where you don't necessarily see a whole lot of sexual reproduction. And others are haplodiploidy, all right, where all the individuals, let's say male, are uh, haploids and our females are diploids, all right? And then also, in terms of our life cycles and, and host, some of our life cycles have tissue migration. So we get in to the host, and then we have to undergo this, this migration to, to get to the final site of infection. Others, you ingest the, the egg, and that worm hatches and stays right in the gut and never leaves. So there's a lot of different variation in these life cycles, and I think and that is probably where we'll get the most confusion. It's just kind of keeping track. Okay, this parasite, this is its, its life cycle pattern. Here's this other parasite, this is their life cycle pattern. Fortunately, the larval stages all stay the same. So if you remember, we've got A to J1, J2, to J3, J4, to J4 to the adult. That's, at least you've got those names correct. Uh, but, you know, the pattern uh, and where that reproduction occurs is what can vary. All right, so next up is gonna be nematode diversity. Uh, and I think since we have, uh, I think what we'll do is on Wednesday, you can come, we'll answer questions, but since our exam goes live on Wednesday, we, I won't do any lectures, all right? You can take that time. If you wanted to come in and ask questions, you can, or if you didn't want to come into class on that day, you, you, know, you don't have to. If you wanted to come in here and take the exam, you could, just, just remember there's a class after us. So we'll pick up this nematode diversity on Friday. And that'll be the start of our new material. All right. Uh, and just word of warning, I'll come in here and I'll wait maybe five or ten minutes, but if no one else shows up, I'm just going to head back to my office. All right. So, yeah, on Wednesday, you can say class is optional, but again, if you have questions, feel free to come in. We can, we can answer them. All right, don't forget our labs this week. Uh, and I meant to ask, on Wednesday, did I go over the practical quiz questions in lab? So, no, on Wednesday lab, did I put up the questions of that mini quiz and we go over the answers? Tuesday? Monday did. Monday we did. I forgot Wednesday. So, on Wednesday, go ahead. Ask me to do that, and we'll, we'll go through those those images. All right. All right.